Wonderful music this morning, as always. Welcome back. I hope you had a wonderful Easter. Our children are having a wonderful time this morning in our children's program. They are um, learning the lesson that Jesus is not still in the tomb. He has risen. He has risen indeed, correct? Right? And he is, uh, they're learning the story um, that Luke records where there were two guys walking on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus appears to them after his resurrection. And our children are learning that Jesus wants to spend time with them just like he spent time with those two guys that were walking to Emmaus. So it's a wonderful story. Well, I hope you enjoyed your last brunch of the year. It is hard to believe we are already at the final brunch of our uh, class year. That The days have just gone by so quickly here. But I trust that um, this year in your core group you have experienced abundant fellowship. I hope that you have made some precious friendships, and I hope that you have uh, been involved in some very rich discussion as your core group has studied God's Word this year. And so I want to challenge you this morning. If you have benefited from your experience at Community Bible Study I want to challenge you to invite someone to come and benefit from what you are currently benefiting from. We have our annual Visitor's Day coming up two weeks from today. It is April 19th. We've got these blue cards. Um, They'll be at the back door on your way out. So invite some friends to come and be able to participate in something that has been so important in your life. And... um, We look forward to that in two weeks. When your friends come, a little bit about that day, Visitor's Day, they'll come in here with you. We'll get an overview of what the book of Acts is going to be like. And then when you go to your core group, um, your guest will stay with us, and we'll be very nice to them, I promise. We're going to feed them. We're going to bribe them with food. So, you know, who who can resist food and Bible study, you know? So um, so we'll give them a little um, preview of what CBS looks like, and then they'll come back in here and join you for the teaching time, okay? Um, We would also like to, if you have friends that have preschoolers, please have those preschoolers come and be a part of our program so they can get a jump start on how wonderful our children's program is. So if you are inviting just an adult and she's coming by herself, we don't need an RSVP. But if you are inviting someone that is bringing a preschooler with them, at the bottom of this card is Lori's phone number and her email address, and we need an RSVP for those children, okay? Because it's a safety thing. We want to make sure we don't have 50 kids climbing the walls in one classroom. Um, so, it's, so just have them, if you've invited someone that has preschoolers, just have them shoot Uh, Lori a note so we'll have a record that they are coming to be with us. We are just so excited. Um, I've already seen a couple people advertise. You know social media gets a bad rap, right? But social media can be used for good. So you can snap this or Instagram or Facebook this and invite people in your community to come and join us. So that's April 19th. We're excited uh, to meet all of your friends. Well, If you were here last week, you'll know what these are. This is Tracy's Chaco and her husband Eric's Croc. Look how big, look. I have their shoes because I don't own a pair of Chacos, nor do I own a pair of Crocs, because quite frankly, I think I don't like them. But anyway, so (laughs) no offense, Tracy. She said she didn't like them either, So, so anyway, what she talked about last week was being prepared, right? So I don't own these, so I'm obviously not prepared to go to Jamaica anytime soon. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, because you weren't here last week, I would encourage you to log on to Fisher and watch last week's teaching time, because it was amazing. But what she talked about last week was being prepared. And that's, we're going to carry that same theme through this morning, through chapter 25, because chapters 24 and 25 are this part of the same discussion. This was, Jesus is, it's dubbed by uh, theologians as the Olivet Discourse, and this is really his last formal teaching of his disciples. They're standing in the, the Mount of Olives, and he knows that in the next day, he is going to be betrayed, arrested, tried and crucified 
Okay, so he knows what's coming, but he knows that it doesn't end at the tomb. He knows that he's coming back again. And so he is preparing his disciples to be prepared for when he returns, okay? And so in the first part of the Olivet Discourse, what Tracy taught last week, he was prophesying. He was, uh, it was all prophecy talking about when he returns, when he comes back, okay? And when we talk about prophecy, I, I know it was a kind of a challenging lesson last week because prophecy is challenging, right? We can study it from now until he does come back and not understand it, right? Because it's just so confusing. But I think the reason that Jesus gives us prophecy is so that we will, it will challenge us to live in obedience today, knowing what's coming, okay? He's not, he doesn't give us prophecy to scare us, but to challenge us, to motivate us to live righteously today because we know what's coming, the rewards that are coming. So this week, as we open the second half, the final part of the Olivet Discourse, chapter 25, Jesus is going to tell us, okay, now that you know what's coming, I'm going to tell you how to live in the interim until we get there, okay? And so he's going to give us three points this morning as we go through this chapter. He says we need to be watching, we need to be witnessing, and we need to be working. So while we wait for his kingdom, we need to be watching witnessing, and working. So the question that I'm going to challenge you with, challenged me with this week, that we're going to hear a lot as we go through this lesson this morning, how are you spending your time while you wait? Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for these scriptures. You're telling us what our future holds, and it is glorious and full of joy. And Father, we thank you for that. But you also challenge us that we are to be productive while we wait for your return. Let us be women who are watchful, who are witnessing, and who are working for your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have uh, shared with y'all before that we, our family has a ranch up in the Texas Panhandle, up in Wheeler County. Um, and so the, the trip from Houston to Wheeler, it's 10 hours in the car. Um, and so that, that's a long pilgrimage, right, for anybody. And we have, for the last 35 years, ever since I'm married into the Fry family, we have made that pilgrimage twice every year. Um, so it's a, a biannual uh, trip for us. Now, these days, it's just Tom and I driving, so it's relatively easy because we're grown-ups. We can do this. We can download some podcasts or, you know, we have the iPads and if, well, he doesn't watch the iPad if he's driving. I will sit and watch an iPad if, if I'm not driving. But we have ways to entertain ourselves. But back in the day when we had little ones in the car, we didn't have iPads. Anybody with me when you used to travel and you didn't have iPads or phones that the kids can entertain themselves on? And so back in the day, entertainment for my kids was here. Here's a book. Read it. And my kids are not big readers. So, you know, that lasted for about 10 minutes. Or, you know, car bingo was a big thing. And that lasted about a hot minute until they were bored. And, you know, inevitably, you know, we'd leave Houston and we wouldn't even be to Conroe before. He's looking at me. She's touching me. How, you know, how much longer? Oh my gosh, we're only in Conroe. (laughs) We've got a long way to go. And so I had to come up with a way to have them obey while we're driving. So my solution was every 30 minutes of non-bickering, obedient behavior, they would get a sticker, and I'd put it on the dashboard of my minivan. They'd get a sticker. By the time they get five stickers, if they went five stickers worth without bickering and without fighting, without being terrible in the back, without me having to do that, right, five stickers, we'd stop usually at a Walmart or something, and we'd give them 50 cents each. And you know when you go into Walmart, there's those little machines that have the little plastic eggs that have the piece of plastic toy in it that is nothing. They thought that was so amazing. They were just so over the top to do that. And so, you know, it was little, but hey, it worked. And so what my kids learned was that, okay, there's a reward waiting for me down the road at the Walmart in Bowie, Texas, usually. And so there's a reward waiting for me out there. And so that's going to motivate me 
to behave properly and to be obedient right now. And it worked. Moms, it works. <laughs> I think that's what Jesus is teaching us this morning in these parables. He tells us there's joy, there's rewards waiting for us. Not to entice us, but to motivate us to be obedient and live righteously today. So the first parable that he gives us is the parable of the virgins. Now, interestingly, Matthew is the only gospel writer to record this particular parable. But, and your lesson did a really good job of telling you what a, a wedding in Jesus' day looked like, a little bit different than our weddings today. But um, So you know what it looked like, but when we start talking about this, we know that the ten bridesmaids, they're there and they are ready for the arrival of the bridegroom. But the scripture tells us that the bridegroom has been delayed. Now, in the parable, the bridegroom is Jesus, right? And he's been delayed. So what is that delay? That delay is this holding pattern that you and I are living in right now, that time between his first coming and his second coming. And so we're all in this holding pattern. We're all in this delay, right? And so the, the question for these bridesmaids would, what are they going to do while they wait for him to come. That's our first point. While we wait for his return, we need to be watching for his kingdom. Now the parable says that all 10 of the bridesmaids fell asleep. Did y'all notice that? Not just the foolish bridesmaids, the wise bridesmaids fell asleep too. So they're not being chastised for falling asleep. Why are they condemned? They're condemned because they weren't prepared before they went to sleep. Jesus is telling us that we need to be prepared and have a perpetual mindset of watchfulness. Okay, but what I don't want you to think that he's saying, this doesn't mean that we need to quit our jobs and drop out of society and, you know, just sit up all night looking out the window. Is he coming now? Is he coming now? Is that the cloud that he's on? That's not what he's talking about. That would be foolish and that would be unproductive. But he's saying we need to be ready. And how do we make ourselves ready for his return? We make sure our hearts are surrendered to him. We make sure that he is the Lord of our lives. We make sure that we are walking in obedience with his calling on our lives. That's how we ready ourselves. And we need to do that every single day. Back to the bridesmaids, though. These five foolish bridesmaids the ones who weren't prepared for the groom's coming, why were they condemned? It says because they weren't prepared. This does not mean that they were just ditzy and, they, oh, gosh, I forgot to get oil. You know, that's not what this is talking about. This is a picture. This is a lack of respect and love for the groom. Okay, so I think it's really important that we recognize here in this parable these foolish bridesmaids who were unprepared, although they neither loved nor respected the groom, they wanted to go to the party, didn't they? And isn't that so true of so much of our world? Everyone wants to go to heaven, right? Have you ever met someone that says, oh, no, I prefer to go to hell? No, everyone, unbelievers want to go to heaven, right? But unbelievers aren't doing the work to prepare their hearts in order to be admitted into heaven. And that would be by coming by faith in Jesus Christ. The five wise bridesmaids, they did, however, believe and love and respect the bridegroom. And so when he arrived, they were ready for him. They had been watchful. They had prepared their hearts, and they were ushered into the festival. How are you spending your time while you wait? Are you watchful? Are you preparing your heart every single day for his return? The second parable, Jesus compares himself to a man going on a journey, right? And so the, he tells us it's a long journey. It's going to take a long time. And he says, and again, this is that holding, the journey represents that holding pattern that we're in, the time period between his first coming and his second coming. And that's the journey that he goes on. So while we wait for his return, we need to be witnessing in the kingdom. That's what this second parable teaches us. We need to be witnessing for his kingdom. 
The parable tells us that the man going on a journey, he entrusts three of his servants with his property. Now, he didn't, it, this isn't the property of the servant. This is the property of the master, right? And he entrusts three servants with the property. Two of the servants are found to be faithful because they grew the kingdom. One servant was unfaithful because he did nothing out of fear, and he just buried what God had given him. So th- you want to boil this all down? And have, well, what, does that say, what does that mean in English to us, right? Jesus is saying, okay, I am leaving this earth, but I'm coming back. And while I'm away, I am entrusting you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and me. He's entrusting each one of us with spreading the gospel message. That's what this parable is all about. So let's dig a little bit deeper. In this parable, the talents represent the different abilities and giftedness, and they represent opportunities that God gives us to use for the growth of his kingdom. And Jesus is saying, whatever I have given to you, I expect that you are going to use that properly to grow my kingdom. And so you, you talked about and you read about how the first and the second servant They did exactly that. They took a risk. They allowed themselves to be vulnerable. And they just went out and used whatever God had given them, and they grew the kingdom tremendously. But the third servant was found to be unfaithful. Not because he was lazy. Not because he was unable to use those ability for, uh, for God's kingdom but because he had a self-serving and disobedient heart. His excuse was that he was fearful. The truth is he just didn't want to take a risk in that witnessing process. Because this man was afraid that he might fail, he never even tried to succeed. And that's a, that's a really sad way to live our lives. He was paralyzed with anxiety, and so he buried what God had given him to share. He buried it. Sadly, his life failed to have any impact for God's kingdom. So how does this parable apply to our lives? Well, he's given each one of us different talents and gifts, both natural and spiritual. And he has entrusted us and expects for us to use those gifts to grow his kingdom. Now, you say, well, I don't know what gift I have. And we're not just talking spiritual gifts here. We're talking, I think, natural gifts also. Uh, You know, we're not all Billy Grahams. We don't, uh, there's very few people in this world that can stand on a podium and preach like Billy Graham did and, and, and affect millions and millions of lives. That's what we think when we think, wow, he had a lot of talents. No, no, no. I, I want you to know this more. Maybe your talent is baking And you can bake the best muffins ever, and there is someone in your neighborhood that needs a pick-me-up. She needs someone to sit with her, have a cup of coffee and a muffin, and just be the hands and feet of Christ. You can use that gift in that way. It doesn't have to be something huge. It can be whatever God has given you. But we, our sweet Lauren that we're in the back, God has gifted her with computer abilities to make all of this possible so our foundry groups and our children can why I mean it's just amazing we can use whatever gift we have maybe it's it's working with elderly people or children or maybe it's teaching or maybe it's just your opportunities or your education that God has put in front of you just know that he's given you something and he expects for you to use it to witness and to spread the gospel there's a, a famous evangel- evangelist, uh, J.C. Ryle. He said, anything whereby we may glorify God is a talent, and he wants us to use our talents. So are you using your talents to bring glory to God's kingdom, or are you afraid to step out and take a risk, and so you've just kind of buried that in the ground? The point is very clear here. When the king returns, he's going to require an accounting from each one of us. For those who have taken a risk and have been faithful to use our talents to witness and uh, and to spread the gospel, there will be joy and great reward. But for those 
who have decided they won't want to take a risk, they don't want to step out in faith, they will be found unfaithful and they will be condemned. So how are you spending your time while you wait for his return? The final part of the text almost reads like a parable because there's goats and sheeps involved, right? And so it sounds kind of parable-ish, right? But this is not a parable. This is a graphic illustration of judgment. Jesus has now circled back. We're at the very end of the Olivet Discourse, and he's now circled back, talking about judgment and prophecy, to where he started, right, in chapter 24. So he's come full circle, and now he's talking prophecy again about the judgment that will come in the future. He's talking about prophetic events. Again, this prophecy is not meant to scare us. This prophecy, this, this should be a great thing for us because we know he's coming back, right? And we are the good guys, so we know we win because we're on his team, right? And so this prophecy should give us motivation to live righteously today and so to start doing what we need to be doing and working for him today. So that's our third point. While we wait for his return, we need to be working for his kingdom, now, let me just say, if you don't hear me say anything else today, hear this. Whoop, 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 whoop. Listen, listen. Okay, I see all the heads look up. <laughs> Get off your phones, lady. Okay. When I say working for his kingdom, hear me. I am not saying working for salvation because there has never been a single human being who has ever worked for their salvation, okay? It doesn't happen that way. We don't work for salvation. It never has been that way. It never will be that way. We are saved by faith alone through Christ alone. And if you were with us in, in Romans last year, that's all we talked about all year, right? That's how we're saved. But Jesus is saying here, once you have been saved and you have made that decision, then the Holy Spirit comes in and transforms your heart. And because of this transformation in your heart, you want to work for the kingdom, okay? And so that's what we're talking here. Works are a response of our salvation, never the other way around, okay? So Jesus says that at the appointed time, there will be judgment. And we can talk about prophecy and the judgments, but we'll save that for another time about which judgment this is. But what he's saying is that he's going to separate people just like sheep are separated from goats. And we have a picture here, a little sheep and a goat. Look how cute that is. Is it up there? Yeah. Look how cute. Is that the cutest picture? But that's kind of where the cute part ends because this gets really serious here. This is, this is, this is deadly serious. Jesus says there's two categories, a sheep or a goat. He doesn't say there's a category of cows and chickens and donkeys also. Two, sheep or goat. What he's saying is there's only two types of people, believers and non-believers. There's not a third pool of people who are just ambivalent people who have just not gotten around to making a decision. Because if you haven't gotten around to making a decision, that is your decision. And you are not a Christ follower. So there are two types of people. People who, ever, who fall under the blood of Jesus Christ and claim his name, then he is their savior. Or people who don't. That's the sheep and the goats. But how will God separate them is the picture here. It's according to their hearts and the actions. Remember we talked about those people that are saved, their hearts are transformed, and so they will want to, by their actions, love other people. And so we have the two passages there in Matthew where Jesus says, I was hungry, you fed me, I needed clothes, you clothed me, or, vice, or the opposite of that, I was hungry and you did not feed me, I needed clothes and you would not clothe me. And did you notice both the sheep and the goat were surprised to hear this? Both of them said, hey, we didn't know we were, we didn't know you were there. The sheep said, I, I, didn't, I never saw you. The goat said, if I'd have seen you, I'd have certainly served you, but I never saw you. Okay, they're both surprised to, 
to see that Jesus was there. And I think this is just so tender. Jesus takes the, this very final, remember this is the end of his teaching. He's about to die and leave this earth. And so this is the final word that he's teaching them. And I think it's just so appropriate. When he says, you fed me when you fed them, and vice versa, you didn't feed me when you didn't feed them. What he's saying is this is personal. The way you treat other human beings is very personal to our Lord and Savior because he created every single human being. He breathed life into all of us. And he says, the way you treat them is the way you treat me. And I just thought it was so uh, a beautiful segue into our study for next year. Um, remember in, or, or maybe you don't remember, that's why you're going to study Acts with us next year. Um, next year, when we open the ninth chapter of Acts, we'll see that this is after the resurrection. Saul, who becomes Paul before he's converted, he is, Saul is persecuting and murdering Christians. And in verse 4 of chapter 9, Jesus comes to Saul, Saul falls on his knees, and Saul, it, Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Was Saul actually doing mean things to Jesus? No, Jesus was in heaven. But this is how personal it is for Jesus. When you treat my people like that, you're treating me like that. But vice versa, when you love my people, that shows your love for me. So this is so personal. I lo just love that this is the last thing, really, that he teaches his disciples. This is how important it is that we love one another. If we have been transformed by the blood of Jesus Christ, then we should be working for his kingdom, ministering to the least, the last, and the lost. And I think, you know, as this last example, I mean, this just really hit me, this, the way he says, you're persecuting me and you didn't feed me. I think Jesus, this kind of summarizes his entire three-year ministry because I think he's sick and tired of us, well, people in his generation and people in our generation saying, oh, I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord, and then not doing anything about it. I think he's sick and tired of us saying it, and he's ready for us to start putting it into action and actually loving the brethren. You and I have been living in this um, holding pattern our entire lives. We don't know when he's coming back, but we know for sure he is coming back. And until then, our days are filled with anything and everything. You can fill your day with anything you want. There's just countless possibilities. But Jesus says our time needs to be spent watching, witnessing, and working for his kingdom. How are you spending your time while you wait? Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for these very clear words this morning. I pray that we will be women who will be obedient to your calling on our lives, and we will watch, we will witness, and we will work for your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.